Hey everybody, it's David. This is going to be my Q&A video on the discovery of Kepler 167E. That's the Jupiter analog that we announced last week. So the idea here is to try and make science feel a little bit more interactive and inclusive by scientists responding to the questions that you're posing about these discoveries we're making. So what I'm going to do is go through as many of the questions as I can that you have posed on the YouTube comments and also some of the questions that have gotten elsewhere. Okay, so first up, Justin Taylor asks, how common are Jupiter twins in systems where Kepler has found compact systems of one to three Earth radii planets? Could systems like these be the tip of the iceberg of planetary systems that are more like our own? Well, the short answer is we don't know because of small number statistics. The only of the Jupiter analogues we know about were detected through radial velocity campaigns. Now, those surveys were really looking for Jupiter analogues. They were doing 10 year span observations where they would take one measurement maybe every month or so. And the problem with that is they don't have sensitivity to those short period planets like we see for Kepler-167. So that's the very close in planets, the one to three Earth radio planets that you're talking about. So right now we just don't have a large enough sample to really give you a, a proper answer to that. So I think Justin's second question is also pretty similar to what Rob Flores wrote on Centauri Dreams. He wrote regarding the close in Jupiter analog could this be the basis of a rule of thumb regarding Jupiter-type systems? The rule might say the closer a Jupiter-sized planet is to its primary, the more compact the system is overall, and more likely to have superterrestrials close in. Well, that's a great question, and I would love to know the answer as well. But unfortunately, with the sample size that we have, again, we just don't know yet. So there are some physical reasons why one might expect to see that pattern. If you form a Jupiter at 5 AU, it's born in a disk, and what's going to happen is that Jupiter's going to migrate inwards through that disk. You can kind of think of it as like drag force, essentially, through the disk. Now, the other planets in that system are going to feel the same type of drag forces, so if the Jupiter moves from 5 to 2 AU, then you might expect the other inner planets to also move inwards as well. So apart from theory, and this one-off transiting example, we also have some ideas about this based on radial velocity campaigns. Now, as I said, radial velocities don't really have the sensitivity to close-in Earth-sized planets like Kepler does, but they do have sensitivity to close-in Neptune like planets and above. So there was a recent study by Brian et al who looked at all of the known hot Neptunes and hot Jupiters and tried to see using radio velocities if there were long period companions to them and it turns out that about 50% of them do. Now that's encouraging but whether we can extrapolate that trend down to terrestrial planets is unclear at this point. Okay so my last question comes from Paul Gilster who authors the Centauri Dreams blog. I'm going to put a link in the description below. It's a great blog for catching up on all of the exoplanet news and also SETI and interstellar news, so please check it out. Don't we normally consider three transits to be necessary for a planet to be identified as a candidate? Yet your team obviously believes that this is a strong detection, so I'm wondering if the three transits is always necessary. So what Paul's talking about there is that historically with transit surveys, there was this rule that you had to have at least three transit events detected before you could claim you had a discovery. That wasn't the case with this planet. We only had two transits, so what gives? And the simple answer is that in the past, transit surveys were largely from the ground, where it's very difficult to get continuous coverage of the sky unlike a space telescope like Kepler, which can point at the same stars continuously all the time. So why this is important is to do a thought experiment. Imagine on one night we discover a new transiting signal, and then we have nine nights of bad weather. Finally, on the tenth night, it clears up and we can observe again, and we see that same transit signal. So you might say, based on that, okay, the separation is ten days, so maybe the orbital period is 10 days. But hold up there, because you had nine nights of no data. So that means the orbital period could in fact be half of 10. It could be five days, and you would have no way to rule that out. Or it could be 2.5 days, or it could even be one day. There are so many orbital periods which could explain those two events. Now with Kepler, that is not an issue. We have nearly continuous coverage over about four and a half years of data. So what that means is that if I claim the orbital period of this new planet is about three years, then I can look one and a half years in between those two transits and see if that planet repeats. 
If it does, then that means that my claim was wrong and the orbital period was in fact one and a half years or even something shorter than that. So continuous coverage allows us to rule out those alternative hypotheses. Now, if I can't do that, I really do need three events. If I have three transits on random nights, then I can basically draw a straight line graph through them and work out the orbital period. Actually, some of you might realize that even this, this rule of three transits for ground-based surveys isn't actually legit because you could imagine that if you were very unlucky, you might, after that second transit, have another exactly nine nights of bad data, and then on the next tenth night, again, catch another event. And that really doesn't resolve the orbital period for you. So hopefully I answered some of your questions. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please make sure you subscribe below to keep up to date with all of the news and announcements from the Cool Words Laboratory. And hopefully we'll be doing more of these Q&A videos in the future. So stay curious.